Hi, my name's Benedict Lopes. I'm the program director of Scarborough Arts. <laughs> You're listening to the Big Art Book Podcast. The Big Art Book Project is an experiment in 2012. It's the merger of two annual programs, a youth visual arts project and an open writing project that we do. We wanted to combine those two elements and generate fresh new creative content and really see where that would take us. We weren't sure about the response, we weren't sure how it would be received by our community of artists, but the outpouring of material and support has been overwhelming. You'll be listening to a selection of writers and poets chosen by our juror from the Big Art Book. My name is Jane Fairburn. I was born in Toronto, downtown Toronto. I grew up in West Hill in South Scarborough, and then verging on my teenage years, uh, my family moved north to Brock Township near Lake Simcoe. And I was back in Toronto for university at St. Michael's College at the U of T. And then, aside from a brief stint away for law school, I've lived here in the city for the rest of my life, uh, mainly along the lake and the beach and the bluffs. And I, I now live in the bluffs uh, with my husband and my three children. Today I'll be reading an excerpt from my upcoming book, published by ECW Press in the spring of 2013, entitled Along the Shore. The piece I'm reading to you today is entitled The Scarborough Shore. The book is about the history, landscape, and people of the Toronto waterfront. On the evening of July 29, 1793, the Mississauga, a British government vessel, set sail from Niagara for the Bay of Toronto. Arriving at Toronto before dawn the next morning, the vessel was piloted into the bay after daybreak by Jean-Baptiste Rousseau, a First Nations trader and interpreter who lived nearby. Mrs. Simcoe, the wife of the Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, John Graves Simcoe, awoke on board the ship later that morning and was met with a sublime view of the pristine basin. The shore was lined with a plush carpet of Carolinian forest, which cast its image on the clear pool, blurring the line of demarcation between the water and the beach. Just to the west of the bay was the Russo home, near the mouth of an ancient river now known as the Humber. For countless centuries, the river mouth had served as the entrance way to a passage into the hinterlands and the interior region of Canada. To the south of the mainland was a peninsula that formed the outer periphery of the bay, beginning in the west, at the opening of the inlet, and stretching easterly as a finger of white sand as far as the eye could see. Within days of her arrival at Toronto, Mrs. Simcoe rode on horseback, easterly across this peninsula, now known as the island, continuing east along a sandy beach on the north shore of the lake she found herself in the vicinity of what we now know as the beach, and from there, despite the restrictions of a proper 18th century lady's dress, climbed into a small boat and had herself paddled on farther still until she saw a line of immense and imposing cliffs stretching far into the distance. Of the experience she wrote in her diary, after rowing a mile, we came within sight of what is named, in the map, the Highlands of Toronto. The shore is extremely bold and has the appearance of chalk cliffs, but I believe they are only white sand. They appeared so well that we talked of building a summer residence there and calling it Scarborough. Although the Highlands had been known to early European explorers since the 17th century, and for countless centuries before that to the Aboriginal people who frequented the lakefront, it was Mrs. Simcoe who first recorded the sense of mystery and imagination that they continue to invoke to this day. It was one thing for Mrs. Simcoe to write about the Highlands. It was another thing entirely during those times to consider living on top of them, replete as they were with insects and beasts of all description, and lacking road access to the developing town of York, 
which lay at a minimum five and a half miles distant to the west. To say the least, this was a thoroughly unconventional idea for an English gentlewoman of her times. But Elizabeth Simcoe was by no means conventional. She appreciated and rejoiced in the natural unspoiled beauty of the landscape. Enough so to envision herself right from the beginning on the top of the cliffs in the middle of nature, gazing out at an unending sea of blue. In time, these cliffs came to be known as the Scarborough Highlands, and later in the 20th century as the Scarborough Bluffs. In 1850, the whole region, bordered on the west by what is now Victoria Park Avenue, on the north by what was then the township of Markham, the shoreline area of the township originally included the cliffs and directly to the east, the Highland Creek River Valley that lies just to the west of the present-day district of Port Union. Since the 19th century, industrial and commercial building on and near the Toronto shore has sadly destroyed much of the natural beauty first seen by Mrs. Simcoe. The steady march toward the future has too often rendered our shoreline a byproduct of Toronto's progress. So much so that today, most of Toronto's waterfront would be virtually unrecognizable to the Simcoe's. Yet despite all that change, some places remain where one can stand in silence and respond to the natural world, not with picks and shovels, but with dreams and love. The Scarborough Shore is one such place. Although Mrs. Simcoe was the first to record the grandeur of the bluffs, Torontonians have been making the journey to the Scarborough Shore ever since. I know of some former long-time Scarborough residents whose parents, Jack Heron and Ruth McCowan Heron, had lived almost 100 years ago now in the beach at what was then the eastern edge of Toronto. As it turns out, the couple were distantly related through a common ancestor, Sarah Ashbridge, whose family were the first settlers in the Beach District and also were pioneers of the Scarborough Shore. I was told by one of their children, Ruth, née Heron Sutherland, that in the long and lovely days of summer, her parents, Jack and Ruth, sometimes gathered up their children and packed up their picnic baskets and set out for a day in the open country. They made their way along the Kingston Road to a spot near Victoria Park Avenue where the radial car route, an electric tram that spanned the breadth of the township of Scarborough, from the Fallingbrook district in the west all the way east to West Hill, began. There they joined a group of locals, other day trippers, farmers, and market gardeners, waiting for the trolley that took them just a few more miles to the east and into a different and seemingly distant land. They were going to the bluffs, still known in those days as the Scarborough Highlands. As they glided along the Kingston Road, sometimes in the car with a cupola of colored glass, they passed through the Fallingbrook district, dominated by Sir Donald Mann's stately mansion overlooking the cliffs. Moving east, they next passed the Toronto Hunt, an exclusive country club whose presence on the Scarborough Shore dated from 1895. Beyond this elegant property was the rapidly expanding Birchcliff District, which had begun decades earlier as a seasonal cottage community. As the train climbed Trout's Hill to the east of these areas, they passed a stately mansion whose three-story turret surveyed the lake lying to the south beyond the table land known locally as the Flats. In later years, this property would be known as the White Castle Inn. Rising over the crest of the hill, they had their first sight of Scarborough's gentle meadows, spread out like a patchwork quilt before them and framed on the south by Lake Ontario, an ever-present expanse of blue glimpsed fleetingly through the trees. Within minutes, they passed the halfway house, these structures stood in stark contrast to the unassuming barns and homesteads 
of the original pioneers, among them those of the Macowans and the Cornells, whose land still sprawled south from the Kingston Road down to the lake. Just past St. Joseph's on the lake was Scarborough Heights Park. The family opted to avoid the raucous crowds at the park, however, and continued a little farther, where they finally arrived at Markham's Road, as it was then called. There, near the dilapidated smithy of Scarborough Village, which by then was almost deserted, they got off the radio. The children ran ahead while their parents meandered along the time-worn path strewn with buttercups and wild strawberry. Only the freshness of the air hinted at the height of land as they moved steadily uphill toward the sumac that lined the top of the meadow. Finally, at the top of the field, they parted the brush and the brambles and sat down, drinking in the deep aquamarine and indigo tones of a still and silent lake that stretched out to the south. Years later, the herons would realize their lifelong dream and build a romantic stone house near the edge of this very cliff. The focal point of this lovely home was neither a hearth nor an arrangement of furnishings as it was in so many homes of that time, just as today it might be a television or computer screen. No, it was a simple casement rectangular window, nothing more, but a window that at night perfectly framed the moon, hanging low on the southern horizon and casting a pathway of silver light across the waters of the lake. The memory of that simple blue window is cherished to this day. You're listening to the Scarborough Arts Big Art Book Podcast here in studio at Scarborough Arts. My great-grandfather, uh, William Henry Moore, who was a writer and a lawyer, um, had an estate property uh, at the mouth of the Rouge River um, called Moorlands. And my earliest memories are really of playing on that estate and looking out at this great expanse of water. So it's always been very much an influence for me. And later when I'd mentioned the water to other Torontonians or friends or Lake Ontario, references to that, I found it curious that outside of the beach and the bluffs area, the the areas that I was familiar with along the water, people didn't really see themselves as part of a waterfront community in Toronto. The book is actually a look at four different waterfront communities. So it moves east from the Scarborough Bluffs to the beach, then the island, and then the lakeshore, which is 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 a it's an interesting word and defined differently by different. Uh, different groups of people, but I've looked at the communities of Humber Bay, Mimico, New Toronto, and Long Branch that uh, sort of extend west from the Humber over to Etobicoke Creek. And what I found very interesting once I got into this project and in familiarizing myself more with all of the communities, but in particular with the island and the lakeshore, that I didn't have as much personal experience with, was that they are very connected, and we've somehow forgotten that. Uh, We we began forgetting somewhere in the mid-20th century, and uh, part of my interest in writing about these areas is to reconnect us with our shared waterfront heritage. So the name of the book is Along the Shore, and it's a look at the Toronto waterfront through the lens of four distinct lakefront communities, those being the Scarborough Bluffs, the beach, the island, and the lakeshore. And you can find information about the book at www.janefairburn.com. And if you click on the Facebook badge at the the top right hand of the homepage of the website, you can get onto uh, a Facebook page for Along the Shore. And I'm hoping to develop a conversation and engage in a conversation with, you know, other interested people with similar interests who would like to explore this relationship to the waterfront. 
Scarborough Arts is a not-for-profit community arts organization. We've been proudly serving our community of Scarborough through the arts since 1978. To find out more information about Scarborough Arts and our ongoing programs and projects, you can visit us at scarborougharts.com.